with our strength and conditioning profession series. Today, we're talking about working with support staff, the ATs, the RDs, all that fun stuff who I know you've only had great relationships with. So start off by telling us about why we do need to work with them, or maybe you have a different take. Uh, yes. Short order is we do need to work with them, but we do not need to tolerate being disrespected or mm -hmm. devalued, right? When we think about the team setting, right, there's there's a couple of different ways we should think about it. There is the European influence of high performance modeling. And then there is the, really the almost capitalistic approach to team setting at this like hierarchical structure. It's extremely based off a of wage discrepancy. And we think about these power dynamics that evolve from there. We, we talk about it with, all right, well, what is the, the rationale as to why I'm there versus the athletic trainer or the sports medicine or any sports medicine or nutritionist or sports psychology. And there's two tracks, really. There's looking at it from the coach hires the strength coach, right? It's the biggest influence in there. And this is predominantly working with football and basketball revenue producing sports versus Olympic sports might have a, a dynamic where the ad, administration at that athletic department is having a little bit more interest in getting strength usually coach because those are the the holdovers from transitional stuff in the revenue producing sports right we look at football and basketball as these high transitory type of positions and strength conditioning kind of follows that that pattern and trajectory now athletic trainers nutritionists they're hired by athletic department and then there creates this almost bifurcated type of approach to how you conduct yourself in athletic departments, right? The, the coaches that are savvy, that have this idea of, okay, what is my value here? It's the value dictated by whatever the head football coach thinks I'm bringing. And then that determines my compensation, my wage. On the other end, we look at it from, I really love it here. I want to be here. And I start to play a long game and I start to try to create inroad and essentially create roots into the athletic department where I'm, even if I do have a transitional of my head coach that I came in with, that I'm grounded here and it's going to be hard to leave, but it, it creates this, this communication or this interaction or this negotiation of who is doing what, when we're doing what, and how we're going to do it with our counterpart. And from a high level, when I'm working with a football coach, I and mean, it's the only premise as to why I'm there. Like I never met with an athletic director. I never met with any kind of admin, ATC. Maybe I had to get like some sort of handshake, great to meet you, where you've been, blah, blah, blah. Now on the other end, the head football coach just like checks the box, can trust them. They fit the archetype or the avatar I'm looking for. They have a good rapport with the athletes or the coaches. They, they're supportive to the mission. Check that box. I'm putting that person in as head strength coach. Versus there's not much of a conversation with that athletic trainer. What's my philosophy? How am I going to decrease the rate of injury or increase the rate of return to play based off of having better, more robust strength conditioning practice? And I think that part creates this immediate like platform of, okay, well, well, you perceive me as one versus the other one perceives you as someone else. Like you're someone I have to tolerate. And I think that's an issue. Uh, and I think it's kind of the elephant in the room where we look at the wage discrepancy off of like when you work for athletic departments, you almost have a higher, a lower ceiling versus if you're on the condition, you have leverage working with a football coach of, okay, they're probably going to get what they want because they just paid him an exorbitant amount of money. And that creates some sort of hierarchical type of wage compensation based off of that. So if I'm making the comparable as the coordinators or somewhere in that ballpark, now, all of a sudden, I get paid in line with that, not necessarily with the athletic trainer mate. So I might make double, triple, quadruple, five, 10 X what the athletic trainer makes. That's an interesting phenomenon, you know? It doesn't mean I have more power or influence in the athletic department. It just means that I make an incredible amount more. And what becomes interesting is a power dynamic of influence. It's all relationship. It's all fast tracking the things that you just have to go through bureaucratic red tape. There's always a gatekeeper to several aspects of any athletic department. Like I want to get something built. I want to get something done. I want to change my group time. I want to organize class schedule around class schedules. I have a person doing X, Y, Z outside of their football or their 
their strength conditioning and basic, like whatever player development they're doing. And I have to go through a couple people to get that done. The people that have been there for a while know those gatekeepers or those people that are influential in those decisions and are more rapid. And their willingness to disclose that is based off the relationship that you have. With them. And it could be, I don't value strength conditioning because you're just a, a guest in our home and you're going to leave here. Like we are the Airbnb whole owners and you're just a guest here for the weekend. Make sure you pay your cleaning fee. On the other end, it's, I'm only here for one purpose, to win football games, but I don't care who I, who's in my way. I'm going to plow right through them. And I think that creates this interesting dynamic when we're looking at the interaction. So the, the central question of, do we have to communicate with them? Yes, we absolutely have to, because they're the lock and key to a lot of the dynamics you need to navigate within any athletic department. But there's also a, let's be realistic with the dynamic. They didn't choose us. We didn't choose them. There's a certain superiority bias sometimes with people that are going to be there when the other group's not, or there's a certain level of, I guess, a little bit of elitism when we look at the comparison of athletic training and strength and conditioning. And then we get this whole conversation about who's really putting in the work. And I've never been in an athletic department where I'm like, damn, man, those athletic trainers are really outworking me. You know, like I've never seen that. And they definitely have an approach of like they are better than you or they think they're more than you because they have a nationally recognized notification. They've been way more strategic with setting themselves up as almost like a, a glorified union. Like they have a lot more job security and a lot more power in their athletic departments because of certain things they've positioned themselves as, right? They are the first line. So they have to be that person that immediately responds to someone who's injured. So that's power dynamic. They are the point of contact between the team doctor surgeon. That's a power dynamic. They are the person that can cut off anything at any given point between strength conditioning or football. So there's a power dynamic. And when we think about that from working with them, it's, I want to know what is your objective criteria for stopping a session? Is it temperature related? Is it what you think is, is unfair or cruel or excessive? What did that like line? How do you determine that? And one of the things that I've always tried to unpack with any athletic trainer is this, what is the actual sequence of events for any decision you make? And with me, I have a very logical step-by-step -step, and I could always come back and saying like, objectively, it's to win more games. Subjectively, there's a, okay, I have to be realistic with, there's no hard blueprint to getting someone better at football. So I have to be malleable in certain aspects. So I always tell people, focus on outcomes, not solutions, trademark, Tim Karen, not anyone else. But the same thing with athletic trainer. What is our outcome? What's our best case scenario? It's having guys who aren't hurt playing all 12 games in a college football season and then hopefully beyond. And if we have our best 22 playing every single game, every snap, we're probably going to win more games than that. And I think that is the true north for all of us collectively. And I don't know how we account for that between these athletic departments. And the, the truth be told is the better I am, the less the athletic trainers have to do. And is that good for them? If they have half of 10 to 20 people and they're constantly treating and helping athletes and there's just a triage center, it looks like literally a battle of bulge and there's people just amputation left and right and they're overwhelmed and covered in blood. That looks like they need more help and support versus if it's just cleared out and emptied because I'm so good at my job that we can make a traumatic injury based sport like football and have it completely, I can get it down to two FLA trainers on the board, twiddling their thumb nine times out of ten. Then I find that creates an interesting dynamic. I will never be that case because they position themselves so well, but it creates a, like a competitive, like the better I am, the less needed you are. They might view it that way, but that's a God on a truth. And that's one piece of feedback I've asked from administration of like, how do you evaluate this? If do we have less insurance premiums year after year, we know that that is probably a definitive sign of strength issues in a good spot. At least you're not hurting them in the weight room or getting them in a position where they're more likely to get hurt. And then, and I would ask the same thing about how do you evaluate athletic training and nutrition? Like, what is your objectives that you're trying to evaluate? And is it return to play timeline? Is it? Is it the 
rapidity of like getting someone the intervention they need, whether it's physical therapy, surgical intervention, and like, can we make that decision faster and more accurately? Are we trigger happy with surgery? Because I've seen it too, right? Like ask me versus a surgeon, what we should do is focus on strength conditioning. You should avoid surgery as long as possible. Yes, mm -hmm. we should avoid strength conditioning and you should do surgery for your class. I have a car to sell. You should buy my car over that person across the street. Like that's my job. I am yeah. this. And I'm spinning a good game on my end, but these are the dynamics that mm -hmm. I don't think many strength conditioning coaches are aware of. As soon as you walk into an athletic department, you have to substantiate and justify why you're there. And then people, not intentionally, but subconsciously are doing the same thing on their end. And that might be coming at your actually decrement. And if you think about it from this, who's getting what? There's a big pool of money. It's $100 million. Let's just say make it a nice, easy number. $100 million allocated to making an athletic department function from a power five level. And we have athletic training, strength conditioning, all the other subsidiary things, like maybe we have a biomechanics or a phys, maybe we have a nutritionist, a sports psychologist, maybe we have these things at play. And then above them, we have our sport coaches, head coaches, we have our operations within those coaching departments, we have our assistant coaches, we have maybe consigliere types that just kind of exist that don't really do a whole lot on the court or the field, but they are massive in their support and decision-making for maybe a temperamental, volatile head coach that needs a calming influence to be more coherent and consistent. But there's a lot of money going out. Like if you have an uh, athletic department with 25 sports, what is the necessary amount of staff to support those 25 sports? And let's just say on average, from a football team being the highest 105 on a roster to maybe some of the smaller ones like golf like it could be 105 to 10 probably just take the median there like i'm saying probably more average team size 30 to 40 and then we start to look at it as 40 athletes times 25 okay now we're getting big numbers we probably need between four coaches minimum of three so one to three athlete to sport coach ratio and then one strength coach one athlete trainer one nutritionist like now we're getting pretty robust number of staff members the end, okay, there's a lot of money going out off the pretense as there's hopefully a lot of money coming back in and administration's like, okay, well, I would like to make more money year over year because the athletic departments are doing better. And who's, I'm making this decision. So justifiably, I'm saying, well, do we really need 10 strength conditioning coaches, 20 athletic trainers, a nutritionist and three support for that nutritionist, whether we're giving them a stipend or a monthly or we're actually paying them a salary? And we see this play out all the time and you don't realize like at the end of the year, you're getting this like pat in the back, like, man, we can't do this without you. You guys are the, the foundation of this athletic department and they're trying to like size you up. Like, by the way, what do you do here? What is your value prop? What is your contribution? And then maybe an athletic trainer has a much better answer there. Or maybe they're like, ah, oh, my job would be a lot easier if fo the football strength conditioning just was better. And they're saying these like things maybe inadvertently or not even necessarily like they're just kind of verbal diarrhea and they think they're in a safe space, but that could have this, this very, very objective dilution of what your actual value is. Cause you're just not as conscious of, and you don't have to do it in spite of another group, but you have to be almost self-promotional when you're breaking down your interaction with athletic training, you could have this like symbiotic, very like, Hey, we're, we're in this together. One heartbeat. You know, all of us are there and we wake up every single day for the, the goal of high performance. And there's that. But then there's a reality that it's not a charity. And, and eventually that they're cutting a loss every year and we have fixed costs of our rent, our facilities. There's something to give in terms of staff. And they're always going to say, can we do it cheaper and faster? And I think that's the business side of it. When you have... You know, basically in this inflated number of people and one entity has this per, like perception of like, well, we're here because we're necessary. Well, necessary is a relative construct. If you're not, you're not pro providing 
a service because strength and conditioning is so good, you're less necessary. And I think that hits the subconscious. So way off base from the original question, which, you know, kind of gets me where I'm ahead that, and you know, that this is something I can go on tangents on with. And it's a big focal point of how to become a strength coach. The book, it's this like interaction between these other components. And I take a very territorial response to this. I get very, I guess, worked up on this because I haven't had the best relationship with athletic trainers or your suggest or uh, sports psychologists on any of these notions. Like, and I, I think it's a lot of my personality. I think it's a lot of like this, I am a perennial walk on and I'm earned everything I've got and nothing has been given to me and I'm not a silver spoon coach. And I feel like everything that someone says at my, my peril is like a direct assault on me and I'm going to be very reactionary to it. And also too, of like, I'm confident that I, what I'm doing is right. Like I really am. And I don't know if that's equal, but I do feel like your confidence can be perceived as arrogance and that's threatening to some entity. It's, it's powering to coaches, but it's also too, like very, very uncomfortable for people who are not confident. Yeah. I think that kind of ties nicely into my next question is like the big theme for this whole series has been tying things back to your why. So how should, you know, my why, your why, how can that influence how we come to to these interactions? Also coming to the second part of that is do the best you can based off the knowledge and the experience you have. And if you're, if you're in a position where you have to make a decision and that decision's up for debate, let's say for instance, that you want to do a hard January workout and there's going to be some guys who will reach physical exhaustion. And anyone who's ever gone to my seminars, I'll tell you the clip note version of Tim Curran's boss. It's find out what to do and do it more than any other human being possible. That's, that's, don't hedge your bets. But with that comes a certain level of, they're going to get to physical exhaustion. And there could be this perception. There could be a long running history of friend coaches abusing their power and essentially not realizing the consequences of not balancing work to rest or not using a very focused approach, more of a global, let's just break them down and maybe one day they'll build back up or we'll just weed them out. Like we'll, we'll separate the strong from the weak. It's just straight Darwinian programming. That could be perceived as that. And like, I could see how that becomes very blurred of, we have this, this archetype as a strength coach. It's like every day I wake up with a single mission to crush the people directly in front of me versus hopefully myself, uh, I'm going to be very objective with what I need to do. And then I'm going to do that at a, at a really high level from an execution standpoint, but a very, very concentrated dose. And that's going to lead to a reaction of CNS fatigue, muscular fatigue, cardiovascular fatigue. Like that is the goal. Right. It's going to eventually fill into these filters of heavy, fast, or long. And each one of those has a fatigue response. And I know based off of that rate of fatigue or the volume of fatigue that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It's when that fatigue gets diluted into other, other funnels or silos that something went horribly wrong. And that's when I'm going to really hammer my staff of like our inputs are bad. We're not coaching it the way we should. We're not holding them accountable the way we should. We have a very poor definition of what's good or bad. But, but from an athletic trainer standpoint, coming out there in the turf, watching me just absolutely destroy these 18, 22 year old kids, it could be perceived as like, this is reckless and endangerment. And they're looking at you as just another strength coach out there with no real, real actual reason why they do anything. And they're going to look at it too, of like, I need to intervene for these kids. Like, well, unfortunately you're going to put a ceiling on our performance and our potential. And your job here is to empower these athletes to go through these things from, Hey, the risk is removed as much as humanly possible. The, the fail safe of, okay, this person has some sort of thing that we need to be conscious of where they have arrhythmia or sickle cell or something that could exacerbate the response to that fatigue and they need to intervene there. A weather inclement uh, environment of, Hey, there's lightning or there's a heat index or a cold index. Intervene, intervene, intervene. Like I am focused on what's in front of me. I'm losing track of what's going on around me. Let's work together here to protect our app. Cause the first thing I don't want to do is ever harm these athletes that have entrusted me with the development, but never get in the way of me when I'm getting to that point where I actually manifest into something better, especially when it's concentrated and specific and it's actually objectively needed. 
And that's where it becomes an issue of their instinct is I want to limit risk. My instinct is to push them to the point where it's actually going to manifest into something else. That's physical development. And if we have a clear understanding of it, and this is a, a very like tangible story. We actually went through GVT with the staff and our athletic trainer came in and went through the whole thing. And then a school came out and had a laundry list of rhabdomyolysis. And we had a long call, talk about like, are we doing whatever we can to protect our athletes? But you know what they did? They did essentially GVT. And you just went through that. Did you get rhabdomyolysis? I would say you're nowhere near the physical or athletic development as a college division one football player at a power five premier school with four and five star kids left and right. So if you can do it, they can do it. We just need to be very upfront of like, this could be a hard workout, you hydrate, you need to rest. You need to make sure you have peri-workout nutrition. We need to build into it. We don't need to come out day one, but we can do it. The workout wasn't bad. It was just the setup around it. The potential is bad. And it's okay to ramp. It's okay to build up into it. We don't need to shock and awe people every single time we work them out. Like anyone can get someone tired, but not anyone can get anyone better. And I think that like discourse, it's, this is well thought out. This is pragmatic. There's a logic and there's a reason behind this. When it's time to do it, we're very clear on this is important. This is imperative to the long mission of eventually we're going to be in a, a position of duress in high stakes a competitive environment with someone is equal, if not better to us. And we need to be able to rise to that occasion to overcome that, whether it's the psychological, physical, biomechanic, biomotor, whatever the dynamic is that we can insert ourselves to have that potential increase to be successful. And when we look at that as a construct to supporting our athletes, I find it's great. It's when there's no back and forth. It's when there's like, Ah, uh, this person is just an idiot strength coach. You're typecasting me. You have no real reason. I'm only here up pretense of my head football coach thought it was worthy because I fit these like avatars that this person resonates with and I resent them. And I'm here regardless and the person makes 10 times the amount of me, like all those dynamics that become problematic. And to your question of, okay, well, we're thinking about this. Why you have to be able to get on a, on a hill and, and essentially fight for what you think is right because no one else is going to do it for you. And you're going to kick yourself if you get fired mm -hmm. from a job because you're not pushing the athletes hard enough and you're not willing to go out there and fight the good fight, do the necessary thing to help that football program perform at its highest level. And if I'll be damned if an athletic trainer is going to get me fired because they're afraid of pushing our athletes. Athletic trainers with CSCSs are shitty strength coaches. They just flat out are, the, the, those are the seven worst letters in the industry. They're awful strength and conditioning coaches. And I'm not saying that I don't want them to be aware of what we're doing, which is the big fight from like the CSCCA. They don't let ATCs in there. And just like NATA doesn't let strength and conditioning coaches in there. No, I don't want to get into a, is that right or wrong? That's not good. Right. But what I would say, this is important, is that the reason why I'm in my role and you're in your role is because I'm trained and I'm focused on that. And high performance isn't trying to have one entity better than the other. It's all realizing that we all play a role. And I can tell you over and over and over again that there's the ebb and flow of a, of a calendar year in team sports that you're going to feel empty or undervalued based off of the volume or the intensity, which you are valued or more overworked. You know, if I'm in June, July, I feel like I'm the most important person in any football program. And then I get to August, I feel like I am no better than a referred from an intern. And even as head strength coach, because your contribution at that point dropped considerably. You need to be comfortable in your confidence, but your work is done. But from an athletic trainer standpoint, their volume of work goes up considerably. It's inverted. Like they're in line with a football coach. And you're trying to insert yourself. Hey, I'll do body weight pre and post practice. I'll do the warm up. I'll do injured workouts. I'll do whatever I can to contribute. But we're fighting to get things on our plate to contribute. Where the truth is, that's maybe an insecurity responding to maybe other components here doing a lot more in a period where 
you were doing a lot more just the week before. And I think that leads into this conversation off of like, all right, when we're thinking about, again, to your question of the why, even if your workloads drop considerably or your workloads violently up and the other part is, is inverted, the why still needs to kind of overcome your internal like structure or internal psychological approach of, hey, this is... This is something that I need to overexert myself. And just that like conscious awareness of I did my part, I've contributed, I'm still contributing. I'm just not as much as I was a week ago. And I still feel like I'm invaluable here and not getting into this like territorial turf war because athletic trainers are now more, more in line with the football coaches and their workload. That part becomes important for you as a train coach. And you need to support it could be something as simple as, hey, you want some help getting the Gatorade out? Or, hey, I can do the body weight pre and post practice. Or, hey, when that, an athlete's got an injury, like, I'm not putting him through a workout. I'm walking to the training room so we can get that done quicker. And I'm not creating these, like, silos of, like, I'm better than them or fuck them. They don't know what I'm doing. Like, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm just as culpable in damaging a relationship with our athletic trainer as they are with me. It just so happens of, like, we need to be sensitive to... The periods were overworked, the period that we have high stakes, the periods that we have a more, more residual, a greater residual from the things that we're doing. So July is my greatest potential impact on a football program. And if you're sitting there limiting what I'm trying to do, I'm going to become very territorial and I'm going to become very combative. Alternatively, if I'm in August and I'm telling the football coach, head football coach in a staff meeting, these guys shouldn't be going to the trainer room. They should be coming with me into the weight room. That could be either perceived as easily as like, hey, this person's insert entering my domain. And now they are. And, and, and I'm guilty of that. And that has a long-term a negative effect with that relationship and dynamic. But, you know, I, I don't know if I did a great job of answering your why, but I would say... If you feel confident in that, the whole point of this, to help student athlete perform at their highest level, check your ego, fight for what's necessary when it's necessary, but also to uh, do an inventory. That's why it's good to have good people around there or aren't afraid to tell you the truth that when you're wrong, you're wrong. That, hey, this is, you're doing, you did a great job. Collective is what done. Like, let's just focus on supporting and making other things. Much like athletic trainers go out there and bring water out there when we're doing agilities and sprints like in the summer. Like they're not the focal point. And then we go out there for the sum for August and we're trying to get the team ready for first game. They are poor in the focal point. They're going to be asked about, Hey, what do we got after practice for anyone who's injured? Like in, I, I, at the end of practice, like it just is what it is. Like not really necessary as strength coach. Like we don't have a lift here today. Or not like, Oh man, we can go ahead and really accentuate the squats that we worked on all summer. Like it, that, yeah. that part is gone. And I think that part is hard. Like we want to be. We want to be as perceived as valuable as all of our counterparts, especially in more influential moments. The players now, they, they know the job you did. They're not thinking, oh, man, Tim's not working as hard as he once did. He doesn't care as much as he did last week. Like, they all, man, like you, you did a great job. You supported us. And now it's our job to take it from here. Yeah. It's really interesting you mentioned, you know, that I think it was the AT going through GBT. And I like, yeah, you survived that, right? We ran into something similar here where, like, the kids are like, these aren't pushing us. And so we had some coaches hop in and do the workouts with them. And if you're not getting pushed and getting anything out of this, that's on you. You're not following the plan. So as soon as the coach did that, it's like, boom, they start to get on board too. So like, I used to be pretty against like having the coach, cause they're in the room with me. We were supposed to be running the group. I used to be pretty against it. And then, you know, we tried it out once, but like, yeah, you know what? If it's going to help buy let's, let's rock and roll. Let's Wait, do it. Friend, uh, and as long as you like run that, efficiently, I mean, increase buyer, you get bigger results. Buy, ultimately, yeah. that's what matters. I'm really good with strength coaches because I have a command. I have, I have a pedigree. I have uh, a certain level of like people that know better know that I know. Yeah. I don't necessarily have that same level or same connectedness to counterparts, like coaches, athletic trainers, nutritionists. Because of that, like, why don't you respect me before even letting me, I guess, demonstrate my value? And I always resent that. And I think that part is probably something I don't think is uncommon for strength conditioning coaches because the relative workload that we're putting in outside of our, you know, I say this in jest, but nine to five, like no one outworking us between the time that we clock out and then clock yeah. out. In fact, like we're, we're working out, we're reading, we're going to conferences on our vacations and our time. Mm -hmm. That is not 
the standard within any athletic department is like, I'm done going home. And they fill their time with other things that they potentially might think of more value. But the truth is, is like no one has, is as driven to becoming as well-rounded and robust from a uh, performance standpoint in your individual domain as a strength conditioning coach in any athletic department. It's common threat. No, no, not like unique. So like, oh, the place that I worked, I was the hardest working guy in the room. Like that's, that is normal, which is a, a very clear way of like, and maybe a football coach has an imposter syndrome, of like I'm their quote unquote superior, which sometimes they're not. They actually think they are, but they're really not. I don't answer to you. So like, just cause you're a position coach doesn't mean that I am subservient to you in any way. I tolerate you, but I don't necessarily need to answer. Like we should look at it more as collaboration and that if I'm doing something in the weight room, that your interjection off of something from a observation or a limited working knowledge doesn't really have a lot of weight. It's the same thing of like, I got on the board, it's already short in place. Like, please stop. You don't know what you're talking about. But I would say like that dynamic is football coach telling me how to do my job might be a route, a phenomenon of imposter syndrome of like, I know this person is incredibly intelligent and work their ass off trying to know more about what we're doing. And I'm definitely not doing as much as that person or as nearly as like competent in my domain. I'm confident, but I'm not as like robust in my knowledge. And I think that part creates this, like, it's easier to like assert like a dominant force of like, you work for me, you're my subordinate, you know, type of mentality versus the, I got a really cerebral, smart person here. How can I leverage this asset? It's not that like, it's not that dynamic usually, which creates another friction. We might have to come back and do interact with the coaches on the floor. Yeah, we might have to, cause that's, that, you know, it's an interesting point, something Let's up the battle on every day. Well, coach well, I mean, I'm sure we're not alone in that. No, no doubt. So this has been, yeah, that's great. I, I think that's a good plan, but, but we're out of Me time. Too. So we'll, right, we'll, we'll let you get out of here. Uh, this was a really good one and I'm excited for next week too. All right. See you soon.